Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Most of you are looking pretty good. All of you are. Of course you are. And you, on, you, you on, at home, online, you're looking good too. And glad that you're here with us this morning. We have a great time as we finish up our study in the book of 2 Corinthians uh, this morning. 17 weeks. It's been a lot and we've learned a lot. Let me begin this morning by just uh, sharing with you a post that a friend of mine uh, did, I think this last week. I thought it was so funny. And uh, it, it, basically a story of a guy at Ikea. It says, man, man arrested for putting fake aero decals on the floor in Ikea and for creating a labyrinth with no exit, <laughs> which I feel is true anyway when you go into that store. But can you, can you imagine him, you know, just kind of peeking around the corner and watching people just kind of wandering around with no exit, no end, no purpose, like you're moving and moving, but you're not getting anywhere. And sometimes we can feel that way, can't we, in life. And uh, it's true for a lot of areas, but perhaps no more true than in the area of trying to resolve conflict. Because if you've ever been in conflict, whether with a friend, a spouse, a parent, a teen, like, like you, you, it feels like you kind of go round and round and round, and like you're, you're moving and you're talking, but are we making any progress? And, uh, you know, sometimes we call that like taking two steps forward, but three steps back. Like we're not making progress. We're not getting anywhere. If you've been with us in our study of 2 Corinthians, you know that Paul's been in this ongoing interaction with the Corinthians about their loyalty or like who they're listening to. And are they following his leadership or are they listening to the super apostles, uh, those who were discounting Paul's ministry and dismissing him as someone who's like hard to listen to and hard to look at and, and, and uh, you know, is not very powerful. And in fact, he doesn't really even think he's worthy of financial support for his ministry. And for all kinds of reasons, they were competing for the loyalty of the Corinthian church and they were teaching them wrong things and leading them in a wrong direction. And throughout the book, Paul has been writing to the Corinthians to try to appeal to them to recognize that these false apostles were indeed false apostles and that he wanted to appeal to them to be reconciled to God and with him and so that they could continue. Paul was the one who planted the church in Corinth he had made a number of visits uh, to Corinth, had written, uh, now this is his third letter to Corinth, heavily invested in them, loved them, wanted God's best for them, yet there was still th something not right, not resolved. And if you've been with us, you might think, man, how many messages are we going to hear about Paul writing about these false apostles and the conflict there? You may have felt like that through the series, we've been only two steps forward and then seemingly three steps back. Well, today, as we finish up chapter 13, we're actually going to find some resolution. Or we're going to find how Paul is resolving this conflict, what I would call only two steps back. Because sometimes in conflict resolution, you need to do that. You take a couple of steps back. But then three steps forward as he progresses in movement toward reconciliation, toward restoration in this conflict. And you were going to find it very instructive for us as well as we uh, get ready for this. So uh, starting in verse 1, chapter 13, let me just say this, that you're going to feel kind of this courtroom feel as we read through it. Uh, if you're into courtroom drama, you'll enjoy the context of the passage Paul's coming into town. He's going to face some charges. He tells them, hey, make sure that your witnesses are validated. Like, like every charge should be affirmed by two to three witnesses, he says. He's going to talk about that. So uh, he, he's coming in. He gives them a warning. Uh, these, these villains, if you will. He, there's a warning to the villains that he's coming to like face the charges. And then he's going to vet the witnesses. So there's this witness vetting section. And then finally, the, the winning verdict that we'll look at. And that, that'll kind of guide you through the passage and give you some structure for the message this morning. So how to resolve conflict 
is what, really what we're talking about. So chapter 13, verse 1, let me just start into this. And this first paragraph, as I've said, I've just titled kind of this warning uh, for the villains. Look at what he says. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember he told them that already. He said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. It's a big deal that Paul wants them to know I'm coming and it's the third time I'm coming. On the third time I'm coming to you, every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, Paul is quoting out of Deuteronomy chapter 19, I believe it is, where this was kind of the custom of the community of faith that if an accusation was being brought, like it had to be accompanied by at least two, preferably three different witnesses that could validate the testimony. And Paul says, like, I'm expecting no less. And so, like, I've got this whole personal response. I'm coming personally. But also, there's this procedural response. Okay, so, like, we're going we're, we're gonna, we're gonna to do this right. And, and one, one of the things that's so important to us about that is that, you know, when you're face-to-face -face with somebody, like, what you say is much more tempered, isn't it, than what you might write in a post what you might just correspond and say, but when you're face to face, when you're someone who's like, yeah, I'm on the side of these guys, but then you're asked, now why is it you personally, that you're, you're being vetted as a witness? Like why, why would you feel that way? And that's why Paul is saying, making it very clear, like I'm coming, I'm going to face these charges, I'm going to face these witnesses, and let's make sure they have evidence. Now, you might ask, well, what is the charge they're making? Well, as we keep reading, he says, verse 2, I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me. So those were the charges they were viewing, based on the, the super apostles, these false apostles, they were making the claim that Christ isn't with Paul. Christ isn't speaking with Paul. Christ is speaking with us. We're the professionals. We're the ones who are out there that you guys are giving money to. We're the ones that are worthy of, of you know, honorarium. Like We're the ones that you need to be listening to, even though they were leading them astray. They were not a, a, a teaching God's word. Uh, they were dismissing Paul. So Paul says, okay, you're saying that Christ is not with me. We're going to come and we're going we're, we're to deal with this. That's what he's saying. He says, I come, um, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him. But in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. So what Paul says is that like, when I come, there's going to be a demonstration of the power of God here. He says, yes, I'm weak, but in me, the power of God resides, and the power of God is going to speak and come to terms. Now, there is this issue at play here, what we call apostolic authority. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later toward the end of the passage. So let me postpone that for a moment. But what Paul is saying here is that I'm about to come to respond. It's going to be a personal response. There's a procedure. It's a procedural response. And there is this powerful response that you can expect. And what I want to especially draw a line under is the relational nature of this thing. Like Paul says, there's only so much we can do in letter. Like I'm coming because face-to-face -face communication is so important. In fact, the first kind of takeaway this morning is simply this, that resolving conflict must proceed relationally. Resolving conflict must proceed relationally. That even though we live in a culture that's post-to-post -post, as opposed to person-to-person, face-to-face, that we have got to see the importance of actually talking to each other and not just screaming at each other, not just kind of posting different things. So we, we could benefit from that just in our public debate, much less in our private 
relationships. So this idea of proceeding relationally. Now, this is really, really important. And I think to help us with this, I want to share two verses with you that are complementary, uh, that give us insight into when, when we're talking with conflict, like who initiates? Like who initiates when there's something broken between us? And so Matthew 18, many of you are familiar with that. Let me read to you verse 15. Uh, Jesus says there that, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, isn't that great? It's like, okay, if I've been offended, I have an issue between you and me, like, and I've been offended, like, it's my responsibility to initiate, to go and communicate. And my goal isn't like to win an argument, but it's what? It's to gain a brother, to gain a sister, to restore the the relationship. And so here, make note that the person who's been offended initiates. Now, earlier in Matthew chapter 5, we read Jesus saying this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there you remember that your brother has something against you? Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And what Jesus says here is that, okay, like, if you know your brother's been offended by you or perceives something that has, he's taken offense from, you're aware of that? Who initiates? You do. The one who is the perceived offender would initiate going to resolve. In fact, he says, leave your gift at worship, interrupt worship, and go get right with your brother or your sister. And so sometimes the one who's offended is to initiate. And sometimes the one who did the offending or thinks that he's offended someone, that someone has something against him, he initiates. Both parties are responsible to initiate this idea of relationally, we've got to proceed relationally in each, each uh, must initiate. Now, let me just give you some ideas. Now, you know, you may or may not find this helpful, but like, what does it look like if you're the offender and uh, you're the one who you think, hey, someone, someone's upset with me and I need to go and talk to them. What might you say? Well, here, here's some ideas. All right. All right you might say, I think I may have upset you. I hope not. Now, I, I, I want you to hear the tone intended here. There's a, there's a humility here. I can't, I'm wondering, I, I think I may have upset you. I'm not sure. I hope not. But you're basically inviting them to respond to that. You know, all of these are similar. I, I'm sensing some distance here. Did I say something? Did I do something? Or I wonder if I've done something hurtful to you. And to express it in a question and with tentative, like that's, that's a very healthy way. But you see, that you, you would think the person who's been hurt or offended would, would be coming to you, but sometimes they don't. They should, but they don't. And we learn from Matthew that if you perceive that someone has been hurt by you, you take the initiative, and that's what it could possibly look like. How are you at picking up on clues when maybe there's some tension? Are you very good at that? Uh, here's one of my favorite Far Side cartoons, where uh, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, after many years of marital bliss, <laughs> tension enters the Clark household, the Kent household. And uh, I can tell you, it's really knocking you out. Um, I thought the cartoon was much funnier than you do, but she's actually stitching in on the S of Superman. She's actually writing out the word stupid is what she's stitching. So if you can't see that now, see, now you're laughing out loud. Okay, so, you know, what what I'm talking about here is kind of everyday kind of conflict, okay? I'm not talking about major issues that can wreck any relationship, abuse, affairs. I'm talking about the normal everyday tension when two or more sinners are gathered together. There is the potential for conflict. 
And if we don't learn to resolve it quickly and resolve it right, correctly, uh, it, it, it builds up and becomes really toxic. And so first we, we learn here, okay, that regardless of whether I'm hurt or been hurt, I'm to initiate to resolve conflict. Okay, so let's finish out the chart. If you're the one who um, has been offended, you know, how do you bring charges, so to speak? Well, you might, again, be very tactful in your way. You might say, you know, I just want you to know I'm really feeling some anger right now. Can we talk about it? Uh, we're going to uh, see in a moment how important it is to be under control especially under the Spirit's control. And so, you know, you might word it like that, or you might feel, you know, say similarly, you know, I just feel misunderstood right now. Can we talk about that? Or it could be, you know, like, I'm, I'm just sensing this distance as well. Can we, talk, can we talk about it? Now, as you can see, there's any number of different things that could be worded here. These are just examples to try to express, like, both parties, when something is broken, are responsible to initiate. Now, for me, like when I'm not walking in the Spirit, my default relational style would be, okay, if Kathy's done something to hurt me or offend me, I just kind of shut down. I'm not proud of it. It's a confession. And uh, fortunately, I don't do it as much or not often, but that can kind of be my go-to response if I'm not listening to the Spirit. Well, if that's the way she wants to be, I'll just kind of keep to myself. And eventually she'll notice that we're not talking or something's right. Maybe she'll ask me about it. But that is really immaturity. That's a violation of what we're learning. So if you've been hurt, you're responsible to initiate. If you've done the hurting, you're responsible to initiate. Okay, so resolving conflict must proceed relationally. Okay, as we keep reading, we come into this next deal, what I call witness vetting. Paul actually is going to reverse the charges. He says, okay, you're charging me that Christ isn't really speaking through me. Now I'm going to ask you the same question. I want you to evaluate yourselves. Are you sure you're really speaking from fellowship with Christ that like you're really speaking on behalf of Christ that you're really you're really you know uh, speaking truthfully and that what Jesus wants you to say he begins by verse 5 saying examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith okay like if you want to enter into this discussion you're going to be a witness okay the, the way I'm going to try to vet this witness is say look you examine yourself whether you are in the faith Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. Now, we're going to try to make sense out of all that, but look first at where he just says, hey, examine yourself. So having reversed the charges, he's now going to give this challenge for self-review. Now, some look at these verses, like examine yourself, see if you're in the faith, and they think, okay, is Paul talking about, like maybe they're not believers? Like is the question here, do they possess faith? And I would suggest to you that that's not the issue. It's not so much a question of do you possess faith, but are you practicing your faith? Are you putting it to work? In other words, what Paul has been teaching throughout the whole letter about the way leadership works based on the way that Christ led. Remember what we learned last week that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Something so opposite of the philosophy of leadership among the super apostles. That would be one example where Paul says, like, are you, are you coming at this from a biblical point of view, a Jesus-like, a Jesus-centered, gospel-centered point of view? Are you practicing your faith? It's the same issue when you read through the letter of James. And he says, it's not like, do you have faith, but are you exercising your faith? 
Are you putting your faith into practice? And that's what he's saying here. He says, okay, witnesses, like, take a look. What, what, what energy, like, where, where are you coming from in this whole question that's being presented here? Are you walking with God? Are you in step with the Spirit of God? That's what he's talking about here. Now, when he goes on beyond this test, he's actually saying, I'm calling you into question about whether you're really connected to Jesus right now. He's not talking about relationally. He's talking about in terms of fellowship. He says, I'm questioning whether you're really closely walking with God right now. So to, in response to that, he says, I hope you prove me wrong by doing what is right. That's what he means when he says, verse 7, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. Like that, that we failed in, in how we were reading you, you in this situation. I would much rather, much rather me be wrong, you prove me wrong by doing what is right. That's what he's saying. But you would do what is right, that we may seem to have failed, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Now, when we look at all this, like what, what we want to uh, kind of pull out for application is this, is that resolving conflict, like it, it is not only just about like proceeding relationally, but it has this idea that it must begin with personal responsibility examine yourself what's your part in this where there is conflict we tend to very quickly say one party is right one party is wrong either i am wrong or i've been wronged uh, most likely as you know in conflict our tendency is to always see the other as wrong i'm the one who's been wronged here you're wrong. And the other one answers back, I'm the one that's been wronged here. You're wrong. And the tendency in our flesh is to do that. And so what we have to do if you want to resolve conflict, not just try to win an argument, but if you want to resolve conflict, there must be this willingness to take a look at like, where, where's your heart? Are you coming from a place of spiritual closeness with Jesus? Remember what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6? Let me show you verse 1 again. Galatians chapter 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Whoa. So when it comes to restoration, it's helpful if the people coming together are actually spiritual. What he means by that is that like, you're in fellowship with, with God. Not just that you have a relationship, but you're in fellowship. Uh, the, the language that Paul will use is like walking in the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. That's what he's talking about. That's what is needed. So like, we need to examine ourselves. Even the ancient philosopher Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. We must examine, like, where are we? What's going on in our heart at any one time? Um, resolving conflict must begin with personal responsibility. Some people used to ask, and maybe you've heard this, hey, if you were in a court of law facing charges that you were a Jesus follower, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If they were saying, hey, here's someone who really walks in the spirit, and that was against the law for someone to say, so you're, you're being charged as someone who walks in the spirit, would they be able to present enough evidence to convict you? And that's this idea of us taking a look inside. And where, where are we in this conflict? Okay, so after kind of vetting these witnesses, 
Paul's going to go into talking about his ultimate goal here. You know, what would be a winning verdict? What would that look like? He says in verse 9, For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. So you kind of want to circle that word. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. And then he says, finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another. Let me pause there. Twice, he says, like, aim for restoration. He says, what I'm praying for is restoration. And it's a, kind of a, an obvious point, but very significant that Paul's goal is not vindication, it's restoration. Now, when we get in arguments, like we, you know, like it's all about, man, like, how can I argue? How can I win? How can I win an argument? And that's not what, that's not the goal. The goal is restoration, not vindication. Paul's not looking, you know, for everyone to recognize, well, man, Paul was right all along, good Paul, bad these other guys. Paul's not looking for that. That's what he means, that, like, like, when I'm weak and you're strong, like, I want you guys to look good. But I want you to look good for doing what is right. I want restoration. So that's his goal. The, the big takeaway here would be that resolving conflict must prize restoration. It must prize restoration. That's the priority. That's the winning verdict, restoration. Anything short of that is not good. Now, you know, he says as we wrap up the passage, you know, he, he talks about aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another. You know, I think about when Kathy and I, when we have an episode, you know, and we kind of work through it and we finally resolve it, um, it it's not unusual for us to kind of approach each other again and say, you know, I was really wrong and you were right. And she'll say, no, you were wrong and I was right. <laughs> no, she, she'll say, I was wrong and you were right. Like, we we kind of kind of do that deal, but the reality is, is that we're both wrong, but now we're both right. We're right with each other. So when Paul says agree with each other, the fact is, is that somebody could be more guilty than the other but because of our depravity and our sin nature we all need to take evaluation like our part in that and so you agree together in that and then he says you know greet one another with a holy kiss that's always great in resolving conflict especially with your spouse you know that was kind of intended to be funny <laughs> can we get a laugh track back there danny on that uh uh, all the saints greet you, uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Here he mentions the entire Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit are involved in, in this. Uh, let me just say this. Let me give you what are, are three practical suggestions. When you find yourself in a season where it just seems like there's tension and we're just kind of biting at each other, that for some reason there's just some unresolved tension. Here are three things to consider. Number one is the, the uh, question or the goal is, uh, what is it that I resent? What I resent, that you be, you're able to name it. Now, the best way to do that is to actually try to say what your friend or your spouse, what you think they resent about you. Because if you can name what they want to name, that shows that you've actually listened to them, you've heard them, you haven't turned a deaf ear, you haven't been just defensive and arguing back, if you're able to name what they perceive as the offense, if you're able to say, what is it that you resent, that's really, really helpful. But at any rate, you get it out there, you know, like I, I just resent that you've just been so unhelpful around the house, and I am just overwhelmed. Or, you know, I just resent that we have just had such little intimacy. Or I resent that, you know, you just, you're working so much, you're neglecting the kids. I just resent that, even though we keep talking about it, you just can't, 
you can't stay on budget. You know, whatever it is, you've got to get it out there. Now, most conversations never get beyond that. We each just talk about what we resent. We argue and defend and deny and attack, counterattack. We never get past that. Now, you have to begin there, but you cannot stay there. And so once you get out there where at least everyone understands what the other is resenting, then you can kind of move to the second thing is what I regret. What I regret. And this is where you've actually kind of done the personal responsibility thing. Okay, what part have I played in this? What do I regret? And when you're able to do that, you are a long way toward resolving conflict. Well, you know, I, I regret that I, I think I overreacted. And I'm sorry for that. And I used words I wish I could take back. I regret that. Well, I regret that, you know, I had expectations. And I didn't ever communicate those to you. That's not fair. I, I regret that. Well, you know, I regret that I, I regret that I, I regret... Uh, if you could move through that, so healthy. And then finally, the last one is what I resolve. What is it that I want to do differently? Okay. What is it that I'm going to, you know, try to break this pattern? Your, your goal is more than just surviving the particular episode, but what is it that you're going to do different? What do we resolve to do differently? That, that's, that's huge. So Kathy and I have had to learn, you know, to really understand, like, kind of here's her approach to life and my approach to life, and she's a social butterfly, and I'm kind of an introvert and need time alone, and, and sometimes we can kind of tangle about how much are we going to do, and, and like, the grandkids are coming over again, okay, and, uh, you know, there's this the kind of, this, this thing we, we work through, we have to work through all that and be patient with, with each other, we don't always succeed. Last night I was in a foul mood after that Texas game. <laughs> Don't get me started. But you know, I was in a foul mood, turned, turned the game off, went out on the porch to read. Kathy comes, comes out. She's reading, and when Kathy reads, she talks and reads a little bit. Not, not a whole lot, but she'll, she'll talk some. But I'm, I'm in a foul mood. And so she says, um, this book I'm reading is really good, but it's sad. And I Mm. <laughs> she said it's about uh, Jacqueline Kennedy oh well don't you want to ask me more about it no <laughs> now I came to regret that She was just looking for a little bit of relational interaction, but I didn't read that well, and I said no, and shortly she went back into the house, and we had to kind of resolve that, but um, you got to be willing to talk. You got to be willing to examine, okay, how did I contribute to this? And you just got to be willing to resolve to do things differently. And so anyway, I, I want to just kind of end our time with getting you to think about Jesus because consider the role of Jesus who kind of helped resolve the conflict, kind of. He did resolve the conflict between a holy God and sinful people. Now, most of what we've talked about today is applicable for anyone. You don't have to be a Christ follower to put into place the wisdom of these principles. But what you will find is this, is that there is forgiveness through Jesus for how often you've hurt other people. Forgiveness for being self-centered and mean spirited in your relational style with people. And more than that, forgiveness, but freedom to live differently. This idea of resolving to do things differently that what's unique about Christianity is that God gives to one who places their faith in Christ the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in their life who is, helps us and empowers us to live differently so that we can break patterns of sinful relating 
and actually change. That's why the gospel is so important here. So think about Jesus who basically left his home, came, dies, uh, to pay the penalty for our sin, to purchase both our forgiveness as well as give us freedom to live differently. Okay, so we memorialized that. Jesus memorialized it. We celebrated it with communion earlier this morning. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. So yesterday was an emotional day. Uh, many of you were paying attention to what was being said and done in, you know, in memory of 9-11. Uh, some of you were busy doing kids' sports and different things like that. And you may not have had much time to think about it. And so I had some time to kind of watch uh, several stories, and it was incredibly emotional. And so there was this, you know, uh, one particular story that really grabbed my heart. Uh, you know, at, uh, in 9-11, almost 3,000 people died. There were 343 firefighters who died, who went into the towers to try to rescue. I want to tell you the story about Stephen Siller. Stephen Siller uh, was actually off duty that day. He was playing on playing golf with his brothers. And when he heard what had happened, uh, he called his wife, Sally. He told her that he wasn't going to be able to play because she'd let, her brother, let his brothers know. He gets in the car. He drives to the towers. He can't make it all the way there. He has to park right outside the Brooklyn Battery Bridge. And he grabs his, all of his gear, 75 pounds, and starts running through the two-mile tunnel toward the tower. And on his way, his particular... Um, a company that he belonged to, the, 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 the fire department company that he was part of, like they, they saw him and they pick him up and they, they get to the towers and he goes into the south tower and he comes out with somebody and then he goes back in and he never comes out. And he dies there. So I don't think I can really do that justice, but that just gripped me because that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus left his home in heaven and he ran toward a place of destruction and devastation, brokenness, and he ran right into the middle of it and he died. And he did that to rescue us from our sin so that we could have forgiveness and that we could live differently now, not to mention our future home in heaven. That's what Jesus did. He went through such great lengths to resolve the conflict between us and God. So, as we think about resolving conflict, it's not surprising that God often says, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be merciful to one another as God has been merciful with you. That it's because of what Jesus did that not only empowers me to live differently, but gives me the reason why, because he's been this way with me, can I not offer that to the people that I love? Consider Jesus when you're trying to resolve conflict. Let's pray. Father, we do ask you, uh, Lord Jesus, that you would just help us to fully embrace the kind of forgiveness and grace that you demonstrated toward us, that we would embrace that in a way not only to personally benefit through faith, but that, God, that we would offer that to others by actually putting our faith to work, by walking closely with you so that you can love through us, you can lead through us, you can live through us. And Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you purchased our forgiveness for all the times we've failed. And that you have entered our life by faith to help us to live differently. 
so that we can resolve by the power of the Spirit within us to relate differently. And so, Lord, I just pray for anyone here this morning who's never really understood, Jesus, why you went to the cross. In that you are actually trying to resolve conflict, what we call reconciliation. You're resolving the conflict between a sinful person and a holy God. So everyone who's here today who's in touch with the fact that whether they've been openly rebellious against God or just indifferent, that they would say, I need a Savior. Jesus, would you rescue me and restore and resolve the conflict between me and God? I want you to come into my life, be my Savior. Thank you for the future home that you promised me and the power that you can give me now to live and love like you. Thank you for this in Jesus' name.